So we hear a lot about this fail fast, especially with startups and new ideas. Fail fast and fail often. But what it really means is don't be afraid to make mistakes, right? So we all try to do things and we mess up and sometimes we get discouraged. And that fear is what holds us back. We should be okay with making mistakes. But it's important to understand is that your failures don't define you. Because a failure is simply a collision between your perception and reality. Mistakes and corrections are okay. In fact, they're necessary. I'll give you a little bit of an example. Is that on a flight from Paris to New York, it's about an eight and a half hour flight. The pilot is going to make constant adjustments for things like weather, other planes in the area, the way that the plane is behaving, uh, how he is on his schedule, all types of things. And in fact, there are over 9,000 course corrections that a pilot might make over the span of this eight and a half hours. That's a lot of adjustment. That's a lot of failure. If he hadn't made that correction, he wouldn't be in New York at the end of the, the, end of the flight. Maybe he'd end up in Buenos Aires, or maybe he'd end up in Tokyo. So it's important to understand that these failures, these small failures and these small corrections are vital to getting to our destination. But in order to know if you're failing and if you're getting off course, you have to be able to measure. Now that pilot has a lot of instruments and autopilot and other tools to help him measure his course and know if he's on it or not or, or know where he is in his journey. But we don't really have that detailed instrumentation to help us in all of our endeavors. So what do we have? Well, the sad thing about society is that we've been trained to make mistakes, right? In school, we're chastised if we give the wrong answer. If we do it too many times, we end up in the corner and have to write on the chalkboard. Probably not anymore, no. probably write on iPads now. But the point is, our teachers train us that making a mistake is bad, that giving a wrong answer is bad. They don't really train us in how to overcome that and how to persevere through that as well as they should. And so when I think about this, I think about my son, because he's in school now. He's being subjected to this training. He goes to school every day. He gets some things right. He gets some things wrong. And he sees the world in a slightly different way. He's nine. He's only about five in that picture. He's nine now. But he makes mistakes. He makes them all the time. How many people have kids? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Little things here and there. But instead of laughing, instead of, of chastising him and getting on to him, we laugh and we celebrate it. You know, just the other day, we're sitting around and he did something and, and spilled his, his milk on the table. I didn't get mad at it. I said, hey, uh, screw it up. I said, hey, you got a mess to clean up. And while you're at it, you can clean up everything else around here. So his punishment was recovering from his own mistake. It wasn't me inflicting something upon him. And unfortunately, that happens a lot in our society. And, it really shouldn't. and I think because of that, he sees me in a different light. Of course, I'm his dad. And his, parents that are in here, you know that your kids see you in an entirely different way than you see yourself. This is how my kid sees me. I'm big, I'm strong, I give him everything that he needs. I am Superman. I have all of his answers. I help him with anything that he needs. So his perception is entirely different of me than it is of his other adults in his life, too. His teachers don't treat him the same way I do. His peers definitely don't treat him the same way I do. So he's getting a lot of different influence on what failure means. And I'll give you a simple illustration. We were playing golf um, late last year, and he's just, we're both just learning, honestly. I don't really know much more than he does. We started playing at the same time. But I have a little bit of ability to sit down and, and learn about the game more than he does. So we're out playing, and he tees up the ball, and he takes a swing, and just barely hits the ball and it kind of trickles off to the side. Grabs the ball, puts it back to the team. Swings again, just barely hits it, and it trickles off to the side again. I can see the frustration building in him. Grabs the ball, puts it back on the tee, angrily swings at it again and misses entirely. He throws his club down. Don't get mad, get better. Think about what's happening inside your head 
and don't let your own mistakes become a shortcoming. Calm down, put the ball on the tee, and swing. Think about the swing, don't think about the ball. This is what happened next. Practice swing. <laughs> that moment, that joy that he felt when he hit the ball and he saw it sail down the fairway, that moment is what keeps us coming back. When we have those moments of, of success, right, when we finally get it right after trying so hard, those are the moments that we strive for. But he wouldn't have felt that if he had quit. So we often get discouraged by those failures when we shouldn't. There's a lot of uh, idioms and, and metaphors float around around this, and you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, the light at the end of the tunnel, all those kinds of things. So pick one that works for you and go with it. The point is that don't let those failures be discouraging. The other thing, we shouldn't let other people's negativity steer us either. That happens a lot, especially online. You can post something and you get a negative comment. Or you post something and someone gives you a critique and they're trying to be helpful, but maybe it comes across the wrong way. So you don't get the positive feedback that you were looking for immediately. And sometimes people can, you know, haters are going to hate, right? So sometimes they say things just to be mean and you take that the wrong way and don't let that steer you. One way that we can see how the behavior of people around us influences our lives is by learning from this guy. Anybody know who he is? Charlie Douglas? He was a sound engineer at CBS in the late 1950s. He worked on the Red Skelton show. And back then, all the camera equipment that they used to film TV shows was very expensive. So they typically only had one camera to film an entire show. So if you picture, they're in the recording studio, there's a live audience, much like this, and they have the big camera sitting here the star of the show is standing, and he's talking to his counterpart, and he delivers his lines, and he's telling a joke, and it's funny, and the audience laughs, the audience reacts. And all of that gets recorded. So then they have to physically move the camera over here, point it at the other actor, they go through the whole thing again, but the audience responds differently. Why? Because they heard the joke before, right? It's never as funny the second time. So Charlie noticed this, and he also noticed that sometimes the reaction from the crowd might have been better on the second take, sometimes it's better on the first take. So he started splicing all these things up, started taking all these bits of laughter and crowd reactions and things and storing them. Sometimes a joke wasn't quite as funny as uh, they wanted it to be when it got broadcast, so they would use laughter from some other show <coughs> and put it on top of what they just recorded. So what he ended up making was this thing is called the laugh box. This is the origin of the laugh track, which was then later used quite successfully on shows like MASH and the Love Boat. And in fact, in 1974, there was a study in the Journal of Personality and Psychology that showed that people actually think jokes are funnier when they're followed by canned laughter. So even an audio cue can influence our behavior in a way that we aren't consciously aware of. And that's very important. The thing is, we tend to do the things that people around us are doing. You go into a crowd with a friend or two, and you walk in the middle of that crowd and start pointing up at the sky. Well, what is that? People around you are going to look up. They're curious. And eventually, the more people that look up, you can get the whole crowd doing it. Here's a really interesting experiment. It takes a little bit of, uh, takes a little bit of, uh, of uh, courage to do it. The next time you're in a big building with a crowded elevator, get into the elevator. And when the door is shut, just turn around and face the back of the elevator. I guarantee you, one other person in that elevator is going to turn around and see what's going on. <laughs> That's called social proof. <coughs> social proof is, is what happens when our behavior is influenced by the behavior around us. We are looking for other people to be like. That's just part of human nature. And unfortunately, social proof can lead to something called magnetic middle. The magnetic middle is a phenomenon where you have a, a, a spectrum of behavior and people on both sides of the spectrum are drawn to the middle because that's where the mass is. 
I'll give you an example. In 2007, there was a researcher named Wes Schultz that did a study in San Marcos, California with uh, about 1,200 households. What they were doing is they're studying energy consumption. And they wanted to find out how to reduce energy consumption in an entire community. So they went and took uh, base measurements on all the houses as far as what the consumption was on a week-by-week -week basis. Then they would go and tally all that information and go to each house and leave a door hanger on the door and said whether that house was above or below the energy consumption average for the entire community. So what they found was kind of interesting is each week when they put the cards out, they would come back and measure that house's uh, consumption for the previous week. And they found that the houses that were above average dropped their consumption by about 5.7% when they found out that they were above average. The houses that were below average increased their consumption by 8.6%. Interesting, huh? So they tweaked the, the formula a little bit to try to figure out how to keep the below average houses down and keep the above average houses coming down and therefore bring the overall average down. So what they did was interesting. They changed the color of the door hangers. If you were above average, you got a yellow door hanger. If you were below average, you got a green door hanger. This little visual cue, this color cue, kept the below average houses below average kept the above average houses coming down. Then they took it one step further and put little smiley faces and frowny faces. They just stamped them right on there. So the people who were really below average, they gave them a smiley face. The people who were really above average, they gave them a frowny face. And they saw all these percentages drop across the entire community. So this is showing you that there's ways that we can influence large groups of people simply by making use of the magnetic middle, which is called the average. So that's good for a big group, but most of us work in isolation. Right? We're all technical people, I'm assuming. We have web jobs. How many people are with website? People work on code or design or something like that. Great. That's great, but it's also kind of lame. We're just sitting in our house staring at a box all day. You know, that's not a lot of fun. There's a lot of creativity that can come from that. But we don't get the benefit of social proof. We don't get the benefit of that face-to-face -face communication that a lot of other groups have. So because of this, we're, we can also be more willing to take chances because there's a little bit of, a, of, of, a, of an abstraction between us and the world around us. So we should encourage other people's good work. First, I want to talk about the origin of creativity. So let's try to put it all into focus. See, man struggled with this idea of creativity for a very long time. In the beginning, we thought that creativity was something that was reserved for the gods. That man was not capable of creating something from nothing. The idea that he could was actually absurd, and you would be uh, punished, possibly stoned, if you tried to suggest otherwise. See, man can only create the material that already exists. Man can sculpt, man can paint, man can make music. But man can't create something that didn't previously exist. The idea was that you could only take materials that were already around you and reshape them into something else. And that was not considered creativity. The ancient Greeks had this term, techne, which is the root of both technique and technology, interestingly enough. But they had no terms for creator or to create. That did not exist in the Greek language. They only had this word, which I'll probably mispronounce, koi, which meant to make and that only applied to poetry. See, Plato would say, would we say of a painter that he makes something? Certainly not. He merely imitates. A painter merely imitates what he sees. See, the artist was a discoverer, not an inventor. And then this began to change in Renaissance times. Men started to have new ideas about independent thought and what it meant uh, to be free and what creativity actually meant. They were becoming bold and more courageous. We had uh, guys like Raphael and Da Vinci and Michelangelo. And that's when Giorgio Frazzari said, nature is conquered by art. So the idea of creativity is starting to shift in culture as a whole. But it really wasn't until the 17th century. And this guy, he was a Polish poet laureate 
His name was Sargiewski. He was the first to actually use the word creativity in one of his works. He said that a poet invents not after a fashion builds, but that the poet creates anew. And he even added in the manner of God. But still, this only applied to poetry. He said other arts merely imitate and copy, but do not create, because they assume the existence of the material from which they create. If we fast forward a little bit to creativity in the modern world, and how do we look at this now? How is creativity thought about? In 1950, a psychologist named J.P. Galford introduced the idea of the scientific study of creativity. So basically, he came up with this. You can divide this into four core principles, which are reasoning and problem-solving skills, uh, memory operations, recalling things that have happened, or recalling facts, uh, decision-making skills, and language-related skills. But there's still not really a compartment here for creativity. <coughs> the two different forms of thinking that kind of came out of this divergent and convergent thinking, we still do this today, but we might not think of it in this way. Uh, divergent thinking is that which is associated with creative thought, which is the ability to, to derive unique uh, associations and numerous ways of approaching a particular problem. Convergent thinking is coming up with that one right answer. Uh, Convergent thinking is also commonly associated with IQ tests, which I think is part of the problem with our education system, because it doesn't allow for a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, flexibility in, in our thinking patterns. So let's do a little exercise here. So let's all come up with as many reasons as we can, or as many uh, uses as we can for this brick. Who's got one? Paperweight. Paperweight. Door stop. Door stop. Through a window. Through a window. Build a wall. So, build a wall. Step. A step. Okay. Insulator. I'm sorry? An insulator. An insulator. Okay. Raw material for sculpting. Raw material for sculpting. See, these are all ideas that could be used for a brick. That's divergent thinking. It's not, it's a brick. There's more than one use for this thing, right? Maybe it could be a mock coffin in the Barbie playhouse. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe you could use it as a weapon. Or, you know, there's a lot of different uses for this brick. So what we just did, you'll probably all recognize, is something called brainstormers. This is an idea that, uh, that Alex Osborne, one of the founders of BBDO, came up with uh, back in the 60s. His thinking, and he's been quoted on this, was that it's easier to tone down a wild idea and to think up a new one. So brainstorming is a very, very powerful tool that we've come to use to harness creativity or to actually facilitate creativity in a lot of ways. But it's not the only answer. Edward de Bono is the father of what's known as lateral thinking or sideways thinking. He's a traditional critic of people like Plato and Socrates. And, um, he said that their thinking was reductive. It was meant to get you to one answer. And he felt it was necessary to free thought from all of these traditional patterns. Because horizontal thinking is like daydreaming or brainstorming, but it enables us to think about problems in a more lateral way. It leads to a thousand ideas, brainstorming, but it doesn't really put anything into action, right? So vertical thinking leads to compliance, conformity, uh, a false sense of knowledge. He says it's false, because it's often just memorization in disguise. So if you think about um, knowing the one reason, the one answer for everything, really that's just memorization, right? It's like we all know that a brick is a brick. And to think of it as something else is a little bit more difficult to do in some contexts because it requires a different mode of thought. So De Bono said that creativity could be harnessed and used at will with lateral thinking that by deliberately thinking about things in a more random and abstract way, that we could come up with a lot of different approaches to solving a problem. And that we could see things in a new light. His quote was that creativity makes life more interesting and much more fun. I believe that to be true. 
later Carl Jung classified creativity as one of the five main instinctive forces in man. So let's think about that for a minute, that word instinctive. We're all familiar with our instinct, right? Especially in the animal world, that's what drives animals. We always talk about, you know, our dogs have an instinct, our cats have an instinct. We have instincts too. In fact, somewhere in that blob of jelly is where they come from, right? There, to be precise. That is our lizard brain. Anyone familiar with the term lizard brain? You're all, all kind of familiar with that? That's where our instinct lives. We think about instinct as we're hungry, or we're tired, or we're scared. Um, fight or flight is an instinct, and all of those are true, but we also can draw on our instincts to find creativity. Creativity helps us, right, and, and our instinct helps us make snap decisions. Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book, Blink. Anyone read Blink? In Blink, he talks about how there's this moment millisecond of a moment when we know something to be true. We know that, that that's the right answer. We don't yet understand why. We don't yet understand how we came to that realization, but it's there. I'm going to read a quote. He says, we live in a world that assumes that the quality of a decision is directly related to the time and effort that went into making it. We believe that we are always better off gathering as much information as possible and spending as much time as possible in deliberation. We really only trust conscious decision making. But there are moments, particularly in times of stress, when haste does not make waste, when our snap judgments and first impressions can offer a much better means of making sense of the world. And that's rooted in our instinct. He hopes to convince you of a simple fact that Decisions are made quickly, or decisions being made quickly, are every bit as good as decisions that you spend a lot of time thinking about. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning uh, psychologist. And after years of research, he's come to the conclusion that the mind operates in something that he calls two systems. System one is the fast thinking mind, the one that Gladwell refers to in his book. System two is the slow thinking mind, the one that you're using now as you listen to what I say. And he says some things are best handled by those different systems. There are some things that the fast mind is better at, and some things that the slow mind is better at. Also, that our mind tricks us sometimes into thinking or into overvaluing things that are right in front of us. He says that nothing in life is as important as you think it is when it's right in front of you. This is what he refers to as the riddle of experience versus memory. So I want to show you the difference. We're going to go through an exercise. I'm going to show you the difference between these two systems. It's very easy for you to say which one's taller, which one's green. A little bit harder, which one's green. All of that was very easy, right? That's the fast thinking mind. So now, what I want you to do is, in your head, add one to each digit here. So the answer would be six, three, nine, five. Okay? Now keep doing that over and over and over again. Five. Oh, five. <laughs> <laughs> so what just happened, your heart sped up, your pupils dilated, the temperature of your body rose just a little bit because your brain is harnessing more energy, more of the energy from inside of you to perform that action. That's your slow brain. This took a lot of effort to do that. Let's do another one. Now you should add three to each digit, so the answer would be five, eight, seven, four. Now do it again. Now do it again. Now do it again. And that's much more difficult, isn't it? So that, you felt the difference between your fast brain and your slow brain. That's what makes things like this terrifying. <laughs> right? <laughs> the answer is 5,037, by the way. So you felt the difference between system one and system two working. That spark of creativity usually comes from system one. It's usually that aha moment when you've been thinking about something for a while and it just comes to you. Or you're in the middle of working on something and you kind of get into this flow. 
How many people have seen the Invisible Gorilla video? You know what I'm talking about? So, all right. I'm not going to show it. I don't have an hour. It's, uh, but what's interesting with this video is you go there and look it up on YouTube, and you see a group of people in a basketball, and you're instructed to watch the people pass the basketball and count the number of times it changes hands. So you're watching this, and what happens in the background is and from the side of the stage, a guy in a big gorilla suit walks out, spins around in the middle of the stage, and walks to the other side. At the end of the video, they tell you, did you see the gorilla? Yeah. What are you talking about, what gorilla? Wind it back, watch it again, and you will not believe that you couldn't see the gorilla the first time. That happens because your mind is distracted. Because you were so busy thinking about something that you missed something that was right in front of you. We do that with our creativity all the time. We get so caught into some pattern, so we're working so hard on something that we miss the obvious answer. So I want to talk a little bit about the three modes of consciousness. This is Osho, he's a philosopher. And he talks about there's basically three different levels that we operate on, that our minds work on, three levels of consciousness. Instinct, which tells us when we're hungry or tired or scared. Intellect, which is a conscious thought, which is what we're using right now, and then intuition, which is this other knowing, that's your gut feeling. We've all had gut feeling. So what he says about these three is that each of these can see down. So intellect can understand your instinct. Your mind, you can understand, oh, I'm hungry, I should probably go get food. That's something that happens in your head. I'm tired, I should probably go to sleep. But your instinct cannot understand your intellect, which is why when you're working on something and you're hungry, your brain says, I need 20 more minutes to finish what I'm doing, your stomach says, I don't know what that means, I'm hungry. <laughs> and the same is true of intuition. So your intuition can understand your intellect and understand your instinct. And this is where it gets tricky. Our intellect can't understand our intuition because it only works one way. So we don't know where these gut feelings come from. We don't understand why we feel so strongly about something. Why we have this notion, it's like, hmm, maybe I'll take this other way home from, from work today. Or maybe, maybe now is a good time to do that thing that I was wanting to do. That intuition that tells us that gut feeling is something that we will never understand because that's not something that our intellect is capable of. And then because of this, there's this difference between looking and seeing. Think about that for a second. Looking and seeing. Milton Glaser was 16. He decided to draw a portrait of his mother. He sat down and he looked at her. And he started to draw him and he realized he didn't really know what she looked like. Because his image of her had not changed in decades. He'd seen her so often that he had in his mind the image from when he was a child, a very young child, two or three. So as he was drawing, he realized that he was drawing a portrait of a woman that no longer existed. He stared at her face and he compared what he saw to what he, he had drawn on the paper. He realized that he was not seeing his mother. He was looking at her that what his eyes saw was not what his mind remembered. That's an important distinction. So he said that the sketch taught him something very interesting, is that we're always looking, but we never really see. So the difference between looking and seeing is it's pretty fundamental. Instinct is looking. Intellect is seeing. That's being able to take that image in front of you or that thought and make sense of it, to turn it into something useful. And intuition is knowing. Intuition is that, again, that gut that pushes you to do something even if you don't fully understand it. Perhaps I can summarize this with a Nietzsche quote. He said, the most common lie is the one that we tell ourselves. So, we've talked a bit about creativity, we've talked a bit about how our minds work and how our minds can trick us, so now what? So how do we foster creativity? How do we actually put these things in motion? How can we prepare ourselves and how can we condition ourselves to be more creative? So we know creativity comes in different forms. 
So it's important to find out how your creativity works. The number one thing that I can recommend for being more creative is this way. Oftentimes, we stay up until all nighters, we get up early to go do our stuff, and then we stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning doing our other stuff, and then we get up early and do more stuff, and then we go home and do stuff, and we don't sleep. Sleep is very important because that's when your brain regenerates. That's when your brain takes time to process all the stuff that happened that day and make sense of it so you can use it again tomorrow. Read books. Sounds rudimentary, but think of it like this. Reading forces your mind to follow the thoughts of the writer. By reading what the writer wrote, you're thinking in new thought patterns. You're opening up new ways for your brain to perceive and process information. So that means you're thinking in a way that you normally wouldn't. And that leads to creativity. <laughs> Last August, I, uh, I'll rewind actually a little bit, a little bit further to uh, last March. Uh, I, a friend of mine and I started a software company in 1997, and I was there until March of last year. It was a pretty long run for somebody at an internet company. And I decided that it was time for me to move on because I wasn't being challenged. And then in August, I realized that, that I hadn't really moved on yet. So I completely unplugged. I didn't tweet, I didn't check the end, I didn't check my email, I didn't do things, I didn't do anything for the month of August. I went to a cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains and just became a hermit and just walked around and you know, sat around the fire at night. Cowboy TV is very therapeutic. <laughs> it was really enlightening. Because when I came back, and when I checked my email, and there was this deluge of stuff, I just select all to leave. <laughs> Try it sometime. <laughs> Try it. Inbox zero? Well, that's easy. <laughs> but it was really liberating because I got to see the web in a new way. I got to see the interactions that happened on these sites and, and through email and all the, the the things that I was participating in, I saw all of that in a fresh light. It was very, very helpful. Our brains are not meant to multitask. They're really not. We kid ourselves by saying we can do more than one thing at a time, and we really can't. You know, the limit of it is that, you know, this, this kind of thing, walking and chewing gum. That's about where our brain stops with multitasking. Focus on something and get that done. Don't try to do multiple And seriously, get some sleep. <laughs> sleep can also do something that's very, very important. Something that Eric and I were talking about earlier. You have to clear your mind. There's a bunch of stuff happening in here. And if you don't allow some time every day to just clear it all out, it's just going to end up in a big spaghetti mess of stuff that you can't figure out and get frustrated and that's when stress rises and then you can't be creative. Something else that's very important is to get into the zone. Find some music that helps you think freely. There's a specific reason I chose this. There's something about the rhythm of music that helps our minds work and Mozart in particular does a good job of it. This particular piece is 60 beats per minute. It's once every second. And there's, science has found that that rhythm helps our brains work very, very well. So you can find any harmonic of that, 120. That's why a lot of people listen to techno and dubstep and stuff like that when they're coding, because it's on that same rhythm. The important thing is to Find some music that helps you get into that zone. Find some type of ambient noise, something around you that helps you get into that zone. We need both sides of our brain, right? Okay? We need the right side to be creative, and we need the left side to apply that creativity to our work. Uh, Sir Thomas Beecham, who is a, a very famous conductor in, in London, said that uh, the function of music is to release us from the tyranny of conscious thought. Is the lubricant of our mind. 
when you find your rhythm, it's a really good way to get things done. This is the Pomodoro timer. How many people know about the Pomodoro technique? How many people like the Pomodoro technique? And, and, okay. Have you varied the time? Actually, my, 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 my husband started it um, in January, and he says he's got a lot done. You get a lot done. You have to vary the time, though. Not everybody is good with 25 minutes. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, the Pomodoro technique was something that a guy in Italy came up with. He had this timer. Uh, it was a tomato, which is a Pomodoro. And uh, what he found is that he would set the timer, do a sprint, get as much as he could done in that 25 minutes, then take a five minute break. Five minutes is up, another 20, 25 minute sprint. Get as much stuff done as possible. There's something about that ticking clock, knowing that you're on a timer, that's really motivating. I think this is really important. We have to stop comparing our work to the people around us. Oftentimes what happens is if you're a designer, for example, you'll be working on something, let's say you're making some icons or a button or something like that, uh, navigation, whatever type of element for a web page. And then what are you gonna do? For inspiration, right? So where do you go? So you go to Dribble, and we see all this beautiful stuff that these people have posted on Dribble, and you're thinking, God, this stuff is terrible, right? But what you're doing is you're comparing your work in progress to somebody else's finished product, and that's not fair. That's not fair to you, because what happens is you finish your thing and put it up on Dribble, and somebody else comes along and does the same thing, and now it's not fair to them. You have to compare apples to apples. You have to look at your finished work and somebody else's finished work side by side. And even if you do that, you are your own best critic. You see every flaw. You see everything that you want to improve, whereas other people don't. So stop comparing yourself to others, because that's a tainted view. One of the things that I advocate to everybody is the soak. This is related to clearing your mind. You don't have to sit in this position to do it. The soak is a process. So you have a particular situation or a problem that you need to solve. There's two phases. There's the active soak. This is where you go out and you gather as much information as you possibly can. This is research. This is looking for inspiration. This is talking to people. Taking notes. Gather all this information. Take it all in. Understand it. Really understand it and throw all of it. And go out and gather more information. Understand it, throw it all away. Then you go into the passive soak, which is where you just leave all that stuff aside and you let all that information in your head just kind of float around and soak, like you're making a soup. Then revisit that after some period of time and the answer will be pretty clear. A lot of people think that they have to make a decision right now because that's the pace of the world that we live in. We live in a 140 character, 10 megabyte per second world. We don't have to make decisions at that speed. Sometimes we can, sometimes we do, but we don't have to. So these are four steps to creative thinking. Incubation is the long-term development. That's soaking, that's letting things sit. It's coming back to things again and again until you get to the right answer. Imagination is those breakthrough ideas, right? Brainstorming, or think about the brick that we used earlier. That's using that creative thought to come up with new ways to look at things. Then there's these incremental adjustments, that's improvement. As you go back to an idea and you, you polish it a little bit, take a little bit off here, add a little bit there, make those incremental adjustments to get you from Paris to New York. Then there's investing. These are your short-term goals. This is when you keep trying. You keep trying. Even if you're at a stopping point, you keep trying. Maybe trying is soaking. Not all that effort has to be active. But you have to keep trying. You can't give up. Jackson Pollock said that painting is discovery, and that every artist is what he paints, and paints what he is. He also said that the modern artist is working with space and time and expressing his feelings rather than illustrating. See, the creativity comes from emotion. 
and emotion comes from understanding, and understanding comes from experience. So your best work is done when you rely on all of these things and you can pull all of them together effectively. And that doesn't happen in an instant. That takes a little bit of practice, and it takes a little bit of discipline. And your best work is done when you're passionate about whatever that thing is. If you're making a button, or you're making a robot, or you're making whatever it is, you're making a community. When you're passionate, that's when you do your best work. So you have to find ways to do things that you're passionate about. And once you find that trigger, once you find your zone, and you find your rhythm, your creativity will start to flow. And once you feel that flowing, you'll know how to get back into that zone again and again and again. So, now that you know a little bit more about how your brain tricks you and how you can trick it back into thinking uh, the right way and you can prevent yourself from thinking that you don't have the skills that you need to go out and do something great, you should go out and create good things. So I'm going to leave you with uh, one of my favorite quotes. This is something that I have um, in my bathroom right next to the sink, so I read it every morning and every night. I think Nike says just do it, right? The point is, we take that chance, then that will appear beneath you. That's all I have.